Well, good evening, everyone. We will uh, start now. People will continue to join. Um, this is um, the first, uh, sorry, this is the third and last um, webinar in the JNP series, Mizrahim. Um, the um, poster claims that I'm going to chair tonight, but I am not. We have been lucky um, and um, persuaded uh, Professor Ronit Lentin of Dublin to take over, um, so you won't have to see my tired face again. I'm happy to welcome you to this important event, and uh, I will just make a few announcements and hand it over to uh, Professor Lentin. Um, if you haven't done already, uh, please mute yourself and uh, disconnect the video. Uh, you are welcome to reconnect your video uh, at the end of the webinar during the Q&A stage. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be shared on our JNP website later this week, probably tomorrow. Uh, so if um, you know of anyone who missed the chance today, um, please tell them so. The Q&A session will take place immediately after the talk of about 45 minutes duration. To pose a question, put it in the chat directly addressed to the host and raise your electronic hand if connected by Zoom. Please wait to be asked. Um, I trust we shall not experience intentional disruption. Any such attempt will lead to immediate expulsion from the webinar. Um, I would like to um, introduce Professor Ronit Lentin. She is a professor emerita at Trinity College, Dublin, a sociologist who specialized in race theory and especially, but not only, in the context of Zionism. Take it away, Ronit. Hi, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be asked to chair this session. I am a member of Jewish Voice for Just Peace Ireland, which is the sister organization of Jewish Network for Palestine. And that's why the kind of little letters. I'm delighted to actually be chairing Svi Bendor's webinar. Myself and Svi have met during COVID, actually only online in a webinar on, in a breathing group webinar on Gramsci, which was really fascinating. And I think we've become very good friends even though we've never met. Bizarre, but this is COVID delights. Professor Sviben Dor Benit is an associate professor of, in the Department of History and the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies in New York University. He was vice chancellor for global network faculty planning, and as such, he was responsible for coordinating staff hiring at NU, N, NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU Shanghai. He is a recognized expert on Islam in China, and he teaches courses on Asian history during and after the Mongol Empire and on Islam in the world. Among his books are The Tao of Muhammad, A Cultural History of Muslims in Late Imperial China, and The Ten Lost Tribes, A World History. I know that there are many other books uh, which I haven't listed, which are forthcoming or maybe have come since. But apart from expertise on Islam in China, Tzvi is a well-known Mizrahi scholar activist and is an active member of the Israeli group Academia for Equality. And his talk today relates to his scholarship and activism on Arab and Mizrahi Jew, not to China. Um, and um, together with Moshe Shiko Behar, who you heard a couple of weeks ago, he edited modern Middle Eastern Jewish thought Writings on Identity, Politics, and Culture, 1893 to 1958. In a recent article he and Shiko did for the Israeli online journal Haokets, which was titled, Do Arab Jews Not Have a History? They actually reject the historical design from Mizrahim by, by Zionism as, as the <clears throat> victims of the Arabs, but also the, 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 the claim that they are victims of Zionism. And they argue that the whole question of Mizrahi Jews is tied to the Palestinian Nakba, that is also not only related to historic Palestine, but 
really is related to the whole Middle East. And in fact, beyond that, in a recent article he did, or in recent lecture he did, he showed how um, Iraqi Jews, particularly who emigrated to the States and to Britain, like the Sassoon, the Kaduri, et cetera, have had huge influence in cultural and political and economic life there. <clears throat> Tzvi has recently written a chapter for a book I'm co-editing with the Palestinian scholar Lana Fatur on um, race and the question of Palestine. And in it, he actually interconnects between what Edward Said called the permission to narrate, but not for Palestinians, but for Mizrahi and Arab Jews to narrate their own history, the racialization of Mizrahi and Arab Jews and Palestinian Arabs, Zionism and colonialism. And I think he's still is slightly related to this chapter, but goes beyond it. His title is A Short History of the Theater of Labor in Jerusalem. And he asks, what do the proletarianization of Middle Eastern Jews in the 50s and 60s and of the Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territory in Jerusalem today teach us about Zionism and capitalism? I, for one, am really looking forward to this talk, and I'm sure you will have a wonderful time. So we will talk for about 45 minutes, and we'll be happy to engage in a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much for being with us, Sri. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I see um, among the viewers people who had a lot of influence on me. Um, I also, during the past few years, became good friends with Haim and also with Ronit and with others who are present here, and it is a blessing. And indeed, um, the later part of the what I'm going to talk today is actually informed by a very interesting dialogue I have with Ronit that is quite uh, influenced by her work on the question of racialization, um, which I will talk um, a little bit about to, towards the end. Um, what I'm going to do today is a, a little difficult for me as a historian because it is race, it is resting a little bit, it's resting on some personal experiences. So by way of distancing myself from personal experiences, um, I would like just to say uh, the few sources that inform this talk that are not personal. One, um, I think in terms of the political dimension of it is um, close to 15 years from the early, early 80s to 1996 of free um, communist frameworks in Jerusalem. Um, that were at least aspiring to be binational, at least one of them, the Communist Party, was uh, seriously binational and in, were quite inclusive with strong ties to the old city of Jerusalem, to Beit Lahem and Ramallah, uh, which provide a lot of experience and knowledge in, uh, in that. Second is, in fact, my, little dis my distant past before I became a historian of Chinese Islam and early modern China, actually I was a historian of Chinese labor. So this is a sort of a return to labor history um, that is based on that. Um, I'm capitalizing on, my, uh, on the two uh, fascinating um, and informing and uh, talks of uh, my predecessors in this series, Moshe Behar and Hila Dayan. So some of, I'm assuming that some of the background is familiar. I will not return to it at all unless it is uh, relating to what I have to say today. And I'm hoping that everybody is able to see my uh, to see my uh, my presentation here, um, if if it's okay, and you can see that it's moving. So I'm going to have several starting points. I'm going to start with one starting point, which is um, a uh, picture from a uh, um, a passport from um, or le laissez passer, in fact, a travel document that was issued in Iraq in 1950, many of them 1950, late 1950, 1951 were issued. Um, if they were children, so they were, they were issued uh, um, with their parents or something like that, if they were minors. Um, and you can see the two little children are not related to me. Um, the key, the key uh, um, statement there at the top in blue is la yasmahullahu, uh, yes, of course, the return to Iraq is not permitted, okay? Um, there's, of course, a debate about, you know, the status of Mizrahi Jews in Israel and how to uh, relate to them historically 
you know, we discussed this in an, in an article that, that was mentioned before about should we look at them as, as refugees or not refugees? I mean, this is something that is used uh, by different parties, you know, um, different areas of the world, you know, according to the political, to their political um, agendas, the present political agendas. Yes, it is still a past that is in de debated. But the point that I'm trying to uh, uh, mention here, why is it not moving? I have a problem. Oh, okay. The point that I'm trying to drive by by paying attention to the fact that you know these people cannot return; they live without the possibility of return, with no right, with no possibility to um, return to their countries, is basically which we should at least begin to understand that they have a status of deportees. Yeah. Now, in 1949, we begin to see the mass migration um, of. Arab Jews or Jews from, from Middle Eastern countries, you know, nine Arab countries in this case. Um, and it is, these are these indeed masses, you know. This is a picture from the transition camp of Rosh Ha'ain, um, the earliest one. This is 1949. These are Yemeni Jews. Um, but I'm going to focus today actually on Jerusalem, particularly and specifically on Jerusalem, um, and draw attention to the complexity of the histories in the city and particularly with relations to labor and geography. So this is Jerusalem after 1949, after the borders um, have been stabilized after the war. Um, and in the section that you can see in blue, you see the uh, um, uh, West Jerusalem, which is now Jewish Israel and also being uh, Judaized. Portions of that areas, you know, neighborhoods that I will mention in a minute are, it, it, until a minute ago, before that moment, were at least were Palestinian. The green part is um, now under Jordanian control, um, and there is a no man's land, uh, which I want to draw your attention to in red. Uh, there, okay. This is the area. This is a much better map, and you can see um, uh, exactly uh, what we're talking about, uh, and so on. Okay, to the city. Uh, beginning in 1950, you have mass migration of um, people from all Arab countries, but um, the main and the uh, um, most significant mass at the beginning are Iraqi Jews um, who are being who are who are leaving Iraq between uh, late 1950 and mid 1951. These are nine months of very dramatic uh, um, expulsion. Um, of close to 120,000 uh, 20, Jews live pretty much directly. And if you measure the numbers, you will see that in the last 90 days of this period, you have, a, you have basically a thousand people a day arriving in planes, leaving, uh, touching the ground in Cyprus and then coming to, um, and, and then coming to Israel. I, I think in terms of the history of the aviation, this is a serious, serious operation. Just think about the masses. Okay, um, I have, I am, okay. I'm sorry, but why I'm, I, okay. They are settled most in several transition camps in the city, but the main one is actually very close to the demilitarized zone that I've shown before, which is called the Tal Talpiot transition camp. Okay, it begins uh, with tents, just as you can see here, uh, very, very difficult conditions. And it basically, I mean, the last remaining house is still the, of, from that uh, transition camp is still intact to this day. Um, it's been evacuated over the years, but before that, there is a period of what I call the upgrades. You know, it is upgraded to um, 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 tin, to other types, of, uh, uh, other types of housing there that are a little bit more stable than, uh, uh, than tents. Okay, uh, for example, this one, um, which is like just sort of shacks or huts that you, you uh, have there as well and, and, and so on, okay. So just to bring you into the, the, the conditions that I'm talking about, you should think about, you know, hundreds of tens of thousands of people uh, from Iraq, from Yemen, uh, from, um, from, in, from Iraq, from Yemen, and uh, from Morocco, mostly, but also from Kurdistan, who are settling in the city in several uh, transition camps, and the main one is in, is in Talpiot. From that moment, there is a process of evacua evacuating this transition camp, settling the people in different uh, uh, areas of the different areas of the city. Okay. 
Um, and we need to remember that this is a divided city with barbed wire, barbed wire in the middle and with you know, two hostile forces, you know, Israel and the uh, Kingdom of Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and the other, which have occupied you know, the, other, uh, the eastern side of the city. Okay? This is a view of the, um, um, of the old city of Jerusalem as it is seen from Musrara. And Musrara is, um, used to be a quite wealthy Palestinian neighborhood, um, pretty much on the border. And it is um, emptied of its Palestinian uh, uh, residents uh, during the war in 47, 48. And in 1949, beginning in 1949 and later on in the 50s, you know, it has been settled by, by Iraqis and predominantly Moroccan, uh, uh, Moroccan uh, Jews who, and the, they have a lot of stories of children playing there, you know, even have making iron contract and friendly motions to the snipers um, at the site. Another important uh, point that we need to bring in by way of int introducing this uh, setting is there is the politics of leaving the camps. It is wrong to say that Eastern European and European Jews didn't go to transition camps, they did. But the fact of the matter is, and we can debate and ask you know, why it happens, that they leave quite early. They leave a lot earlier than everybody else and they leave usually to better locations, which I'm gonna uh, discuss also in a few minutes. This is the view of the Talpiot uh, transition camp in 1965. That's around the same, around the year I was born, a few months before I was born. And this is still, you know, this is how still people lived in, the, in, the, in that particular camp. Many others already moved uh, to other locations. Okay. Another point that I'm going to, another location that I want to mention is Bet Mazmil or Kiryat Yovel. Um, another Palestinian um, uh, uh, village that has that, you know, been evacuated in 1948 and being populated by uh, different uh, people, different migrants to the city from different countries, not necessarily um, Israeli Jews, but also European Jews as well. Okay. Now, the transition camp, this transition camp, the Talpiot transition camp is pretty serious, it's pretty big. Um, my colleague Orit Bashkin uh, wrote a book, Impossible Exodus, in which she dwells a lot about, you know, the goings on and the, li the daily life in this camp. It was very hard for me to read that because she des describes very, very hard con harsh conditions, particularly in the early stages of the Iraqi and Moroccan migrations to that camp. Um, from starvations, um, um, violence, a lot of um, a lot of problems. And one of the things you can see here is one of the um, is an interesting um, um, event, you know, in 1955, it says, you know, um, a gathering of Mizrahi Jews, or here it says tribes of the East. Um, it is, and it is in the Histad route or the labor union uh, uh, club in that particular camp. Um, and one of the speakers is someone very dear to us. His name is Avraham Abbas. You know, um, a, a Histad route and a social, Zionist socialist operative who is a Syrian migrant, was very much involved in labor, um, um, in labor questions at that time. I think here he's still speaking as part of an attempt to co-opt the people in the, in, the, um, in the camp, but only a few years later, three years later, he would already publish a scathing report about you know, the policies of the labor party towards um, Arab Jews. Um, and would basically um, express his disappointment and his disillusionment, you know, from Zionist socialism in that part. He, he died a very young man a year later. Um, the other goings on in Jerusalem at the time is, you know, efforts of settling um, the people, mostly from that transition camp in different places, produce different types of housing. For example, this is the asbestos homes. Okay, um, it looks like uh, a pastoral uh, Swiss uh, uh, village because everybody is, has to, is, is in love with the European style, you know, roof tiles, which have nothing to do with the Middle East, um, with the Middle Eastern weather and climate. But, you know, underneath what you see, is, in fact, this is asbestos. This was treated and understood by a lot of people who live there as, um, as uh, um, in fact, as a form of a transition camp as well. These transition camps, um, asbestos were active and were um, pretty much inhabited until the late 70s. 
And the way in which people left them is also interesting. I can tell you um, one, my own personal experience. An aunt of mine was living in one of those. And when the Israel, when the Jerusalem, uh, um, when the municipality of Jerusalem built a new neighborhood um, in Neve Yaakov in the north of Jerusalem in the 70s, she basically went to squat one of those uh, apartments. And in order to prevent, to make sure that the government would force her to go back to the asbestos, we all went and destroyed one of the asbestos and destroyed the house, you know, the, so, the, so she can get a right to live in another territory, which by the way, was beyond the green line, but I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. For some reason, I have a problem at some point uh, moving between uh, stuff, I hope you don't mind. Now, what dictates the way in which the city and the, the city and the government uh, um, settled people in Jerusalem, okay, between 1949 and 1950, okay? And again, I'm returning to the reality of the divided city with barbed wires, borders, and at least snipers on one side. And I'm calling it a sniper geography. Why snip sniper geography? Because if you look at the line around here, yes, you should assume, um, you should assume that between uh, that, you know, there are snipers, um, Jordanian snipers along the line, okay? That sometimes there are incidents of shootings and so on. So that green line at that time is actually quite dangerous to live, uh, uh, to live there. Um, and, you know, many people would tell you that, you know, they were forcibly moved to territories such as Musrara, such as Abu Tur, uh, um, um, uh, um, along the, uh, the green line, along that line and, and, and so on. And they may, many of them would try to escape and go back to the transition camp because it was very dangerous to live there. Many others simply got used to live um, in the mine, within the minefields and within the bullets. Now, why do I call it sniper geography? Because if you think about the city, as long as you were outside of that sniper territory and out of the range of a Jordanian rifle, things were okay. So the wonderful uh, neighborhood of Katamon, you know, home of uh, Palestinian intellectual Khalil Sakakini was not then dangerous. So she became, it be, the, the, the neighborhood became home of the emerging state-made middle class that was setting in the city and working for the history group or for the government, okay? You should imagine that they, were came, that they came mostly from uh, uh, of European descent. The neighborhood of Talbiye, which was also safe because it was way far from uh, uh, the green line, at least from the rifles uh, uh, point of view, uh, become home of even uh, more uh, wealthy uh, uh, people to this, uh, to this day, okay? After 67, all of these territories are gonna be immediately gentrified completely. Now, where, where, what, what, where do other people live? And this is another uh, a map that explains a little bit more what I'm talking about um, in terms of that. Other people live or leave the transition camp and move into big projects that are built by uh, men, by Solel Bonet, which is a, one of the most important uh, uh, um, construction companies owned by the Hista Group. Um, and, they, uh, and the workers there are men with families who arrived in Israel, let's say in their 30s, 20s, uh, uh, 40s, even 50s. Um, usually traditional men, and well into the 70s, even the early 80s, you can still see them, see them coming back uh, uh, from work after a day of work in those areas, in those neighborhoods, um, um, dressed in usually in hockey with black berets and, you know, rushing to the synagogue uh, and so on. Of course, there were predominantly, you know, Arab, Jewish, mostly Iraqi um, and Moroccan, and they build a whole envelope of neighborhoods in southwestern Jerusalem and in western Jerusalem in areas such as Bet Mazmil, Kiryat Yovel, where, um, there is, where um, these people are gonna, a lot of people are moving out of the transition camps to live there, okay? So this is another thing uh, uh, that is uh, uh, happening. Um, my own family moves, um, which is a quite large family, moves to an area called Katamonim, to be greatly distinguished from Katamon, yes. Katamonim, you can find it, um, let's say, um, around here in this, uh, uh, in this area here, just close to Beth Safafa, yes. 
um, um, in, in, in this area here. I think that someone is controlling my screen at the same time that I do. So I apologize for uh, things that are happening. Okay. And we're talking about a neighborhood um, with uh, people from uh, different places in the Middle East, uh, numbering in the tens of thousands, a big, big project. Okay. Now, I begin my story about labor, thinking about, you know, two uh, villages that basically become, you know, neighborhoods in Western Jerusalem, two Palestinian villages. One of them is Lifta, and the other one is Sheikh Badr. Uh, Sheikh Badr, in fact, was... Uh, um, it was a clan within of the Lifta community, but apparently there was a quarrel, an internal quarter at some point in the um, in Lifta, and Sheikh Badr with his clan moved to another hill, um, uh, not very far from Lifta, you know, and settled uh, uh, settled there, um, you know, creating a neighborhood slash uh, a village in in that uh, particular area. Both locations, of course, are destroyed in 1948, and in 1949, we found them empty. This is a uh, reconstruction of an image of uh, Sheikh Badr. It was, by and large, Palestinian, although there was some Jewish uh, uh, presence. It was a relatively wealthy uh, uh, neighborhood in Jerusalem before 1940, 1948. Okay. What happens to Sheikh Badr after that? Okay. Well, um, in the middle of the hill, you see a very important institution called Binyanea Hauma, which is a concert hall, um, um, performance hall that is built right in the center of that. You can see it right here. Sheikh Badr, the village itself is around here. Part of it becomes a, a parking lot. But I want to draw your attention to the houses here in this particular area. Many of them you cannot see. Okay, This is a better view. And I draw your attention to what you have around here. This is a later... Uh, uh, picture. It is becoming a home of two governmental institutions. One of them is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the second is the uh, Bureau of Statistics. And one of the things that you, one of the things that you, that I can describe to you uh, very, very clearly, because I'm very into, I have intimate knowledge of that, of the, the Bureau of Statistics, basically the Palestinian homes uh, the homes of the uh, the homes became, you know, bureaus. In other words, if the Bureau of Statistics was um, has a has a section, a branch, or an office that uh, measures prices, or measures measure labor, or measures health, and so on, so each house becomes that bureau. Okay, and that's very very important. In other words, it's not one building; it's one village or one neighborhood that each residence hall, each private resident home becomes an office. And when you walk inside, you see clerks working on the data that the Bureau of Statistics is collecting, okay? So these are the clerks. And, you know, I would say by and large, you know, are of part of the state-made middle class and the Jerusalem bureaucracy, which is this also the state bureaucracy that is relocating into the city because the government of Israel is now there, okay? Um, but I want to draw your attention, in fact, to the people who clean those offices, okay, or in fact, which are homes, Palestinian homes turned offices in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the Bureau of Statistics. Okay, this is uh, what we see here. This is a brochure that the Bureau of Statistics produced in, 19, in early 1973, honoring the cleaning, the women who were cleaning um those um uh those homes and you know i just translated portion of what is written there you can read you know this is uh, the head of the um the maintenance uh, uh, office within the bureau of statistics you know talking about you know how important the work they do um etc cetera, etc cetera. these women um all women in um, all ages you know were coming to work in the afternoon after the clerks were going um uh, we're going home. Um, many of them would bring their grandchildren or their children, you know, who are out of school. And pretty much until the evening for several hours, they were cleaning these offices. Many of them in the morning were cleaning private homes of different people in the city. Sometimes the same or private homes, maybe of the clerks um, whose offices they were cleaning uh, later. Okay. Um, so um, this is perhaps the first labor story I'm telling you here, you know, who cleaned, who cleaned the ministries, the governmental ministries, the parliament, you know, the schools, 
um, the various uh, uh, the various uh, institutions of, of the city that are emerging in the six in the fifties and the sixties, uh, Mizrahi women who are emigrating to the city in the fifties and in the sixties and finding jobs in these places. Of course, they are educated as well there. This is a school, a makeshift school that was opened in 1970, inaugurated and founded in 1972 to teach them uh, a little bit of how to read Hebrew and so on. And this brochure praised the joy of learning of uh, these women. Um, here you see a gate to Hebrew and the, 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 two, uh, uh, the two women who are uh, there, I know them very well. One of them is from Morocco and another one is from Iran. You know, they are uh, um, praised for their intense curiosity for what they are reading, okay? Um, this is my grandmother, Salha. She was born in Baghdad. Uh, she cleaned that place for many, many decades. Um, and she's been praised here for showing up like a clock yeah, to work, okay? Now, we're talking about a lot of people, okay? A lot, a lot, of, um, a lot of women. Um, who are doing uh, uh, that job? If we, if I can, um, if I'm allowed a digression for a little bit, you know, to talk about Mizrahi history in general. So the image of the Mizrahi cleaning woman who is going to a private Ashkenazi home to clean it has been a little bit studied more and is actually romanticized a little bit. Some argument, some there is an argument that says that the idea of the association with uh, um, Mizrahim and blackness in Israel, of course, because you know the homeowners used to refer to these cleaning women as Schwarze, black in Yiddish, you know, and basically to say, you know, this is uh, um, um, this is how you know the beginning of the idea that you know Mizrahim are identified as blacks, you know. So it was like in a very very domestic situation. In fact. Um, that I think image is a little bit romanticized. What you see, what we need to pay attention more is actually the masses of women who were cleaning the Israeli government home, government offices in different uh, um, um, in different locations in Jerusalem, but and also of course elsewhere. This is Sheikh Badr today. Sheikh Badr today is a luxury uh, neighborhood. The, the the Bureau of Statistics and uh, migrated to a new building in a new area in Lifta. Um, um, you, can see that, you can see that building right here, actually. This is the area, this is Lifta here. Um, and this is the Bureau of Statistics right here. No, this is not the Bureau of Statistics, I'm sorry. It's, it's a little hidden, but it's very much in this area. This is now a luxury, a luxury um, uh, uh, neighborhood in Jerusalem, very, very expensive. And you can just imagine, you know, filling the gaps in the history of what's going on in that particular location. Okay, I'm moving on now to a new location, but before I'm I'm doing that, I'm going to talk for one minute about the fact that you know there is a lot of resistance in the city. Okay, I hinted that there was resistance before. I don't know why it's moving. There was resistance before already. There is a lot of violence and 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 and, and some even sometimes criminality, but also protest in the transition camp. Um, the main eruption, of course, in 1971, with the rise of the Black Panthers, uh, uh, the Israeli Black Panthers, you know, mostly Moroccan and uh, Iraqi, but also from other uh, 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 countries, okay, protesting, you know, the uh, discriminatory policies of the state of Israel and the government of Israel, um, and, and, and so on. The main, the two main locations, I mean, the number, the legendary location is, of course, the neighborhood of Musrara, okay. And the second location is the neighborhood of Katamonim, which I mentioned before, which is much larger uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, numbers. This is important because it also begins to govern the way in which the government begins to rate to the city. I'm taking you to another geographical slash labor story. And, and this is the area of Atarot or Kalandia. Okay. Um, in, northern, uh, uh, in Northern Jerusalem, this is the, this is the map uh, you can see this is the area, the industrial zone that is created here. This is the Kalandia refugee camp. This is a contemporary map. Okay. Now, early Zionist settlement in the area began in 1912 when Hachsharata Yishuv, I don't know what is the name in English of that uh, company. It is associated, of course, with Chaim Klavirsky, purchases land uh, um, in that particular area and created an agricultural settlement. Um, 
um, an agricultural settlement that is probably meant to supply the city with milk and with other agricultural products. Um, it's a small moshav. You know, in the picture, you can see a man named Yaakov Pat. And the ironies of history are enormous uh, here and too numerous to say. Yaakov Pat is now a neighborhood. Uh, there's a neighborhood, big project neighborhood in Jerusalem near Katamoni that is named after him. Um, uh, later. This is in 1912-1913. This is the Moshav in the early 1940s. It was sort of an economic failure uh, of sorts. In, 19, um, in 1946, um, other, uh, um, uh, there's more development in this area. Uh, what you have there, what you have there is a, is a quarry that you can see around here. And there's also a um, airport. Okay, this is the runway of the, this is the runway of the airport. You can see Atarot around here, and this is eight kilometers north of Jerusalem, five kilometers south of Ramallah. Okay, and this is of course the area that we, we in Hebrew we call Atarot, but it's also it's 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 Kalandia. It's a village, but also the name of the entire uh, territory. The Atarot Airport, which is a fascinating story, I cannot talk about it at all here. I'm just going to mention that it was kind of operating on and off during the mandatory days. Had it uh, was actually flourishing under John Denian rule, and there were some attempts to have their uh, uh, to turn it even into an international airport in the 60s and in the 70s. Today, it's something completely different. I'll return to it at the end, but it's no longer uh, uh, an airport. This is another view of the Kalandia Atarot area. Now, fast forward to 1970. We are now four years or a little bit more than three and a half years after the uh, 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 67, the occupation of 1967, and the city um, and the government begins to develop Atarot or Kalandia as an industrial zone. Now, I make one point about you know the logic of of uh, the logic of settling and, and colonizing these areas. If you think about it, it begins in the beginning of the 20th century. It begins as an agricultural uh, uh, is an agri is an agricultural uh, location. You know, as an agri agricultural site. But now we're talking about industry. Okay, I, I think that if you think about it along the, those lines, you can see certain differences that are important. Okay, now. The government decides, and this is the legendary Minister of Treasury, Pinhas Sapir, he um, 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 authorizes you know, an enormous amount of money, 9 million Israeli pounds of that time, you know, invested in, the, in this area, in a very, very small area within three years. Okay? Um, they are talking about huge, huge uh, 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 territory that will be developed in this area for uh, mostly factories that are going to be resettled into this place, okay? Um, and here is another note, you know, celebrating pretty much uh, that area. So in 1970, they begin to, uh, they begin to develop um, that place, which is already in, the, in 72, 73, will be already operating. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about this uh, uh, story here because it is revealing the logic behind that. And I'm going to focus on one of the paragraphs here in which one of the operatives, you know, uh, Mr. Belkin, he says, uh, quote, that, you know, the most important part of that he says, he comments that, you know, they, are, they already built 50 uh, factories there and all sorts of uh, uh, things that they are doing. And, you know, um, they are thinking about how to take more uh, land that is now, unfortunately, is in private hands you know, um, how to, you know, uh, build around those uh, private lands, you know, of course, private Palestinian land, etc., et and how to keep developing it even more, okay? And then he makes an interesting comment. He says um, that, you know, I'm going to translate from the Hebrew because I cannot see my own translation. Um, he says here that he says that a lot of, a lot of uh, industries who are based in uh, um, the coast, coastal Israel are interested in relocating to this area because they also appreciate the fact that there is a um, very large workforce in the rural, uh, in the villages around Ramallah and around Jerusalem. In other words, what we're talking about here is um, 
in fact, um, a clear and very open uh, attempt to pro proletarianize, you know, the, the masses of Palestinians who are in the villages and neighborhoods between North Jerusalem and Southern Ramallah, okay, who are go now going to become workers in those factories. Um, who else is going to be working there? That's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Okay, let's take a look at this um, a wonderful uh, a factory. This is a factory that produces uh, um, heating and, and cooling uh, devices, you know, air conditioners and, and, and radiators, you know, who is relocating to this area. Now, this factory ex uh, before 1967 or until 1970 was actually in Lifta. In other words, it was in another Palestinian uh, territory, but another Palestinian uh, uh, area. In Lifta, there used to be a very small, after the, in the 50s and the 60s, there was a very, very small industrial zone, okay? Uh, with uh, uh, privately owned factories, uh, with some, uh, with uh, Mizrahi uh, uh, workers there. Now, when they move, they grow in numbers tremendously. I recently asked my father, he used to be, who worked in this factory for many, many decades. I said, how many, I estimated there were, there were maybe, few dozens of people working in the Lifta version of this particular factory. I asked him how many worked there, you know, before you relocated to Atarot, before you relocated to the new industrial zone. And, he, and I was astonished because he said there were three workers. And he says, then they, were, they combined the two factories nearby and we were six, okay? Now, I mentioned this because when they moved to Atarot, the number grows, the number of uh, Jewish workers grows to several dozens and the, and the number of the majority of the workers are Palestinians they're probably uh, in the hundreds in this area and should maybe even you should double it by all the factories that are built around so you can see a picture of you know a, a dramatic rise in uh, a labor workforce uh, uh, in blue collar workers you know working in factories that basically are in an area that is created um, as part of uh, as part of a, a, a government, uh, let's say government initiative, but also catering to a private privately owned industries. This is pretty much a, an incredibly a, a harmonious cooperation between private capital and socialist capital that is either imported uh, uh, from uh, global jewelry or you know, um, Israeli taxes that are being poured there by the government in order to develop this area. And you can, if you could read the story of what I quote this Mr. So, this Mr. Belkin, he even complains that you know, there are a lot of other factories from coastal Israel who want to move to this industrial zone in order to capitalize on the masses of you know, cheap labor that is now suddenly became available. Okay? And they can't do this because there's not a lot of land. Okay, in um, in this area. Okay, so what was the life of the people? What was kind of the everyday life of the people uh, um, who worked there? Okay, so I want you to imagine a van that leaves Jerusalem. Um, let's say the, uh, the various project areas uh, um, of Mizrahi uh, concentrations area in Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem around before 5 a.m. And he goes all the way to, um, to, let's say, let me go back to the map. Goes all the way to the area um, of Kalandia. You know, basically it means it goes across, across the old green line, you know, moving west um, from southwest uh, to the e to, to, towards the eastern part of the city and then following the road of the older green line, which is now of course non-existent anymore, all the way to Kalandia collecting workers. Okay, these are Jewish workers. Um, and when they arrive in the industrial zone, they meet you know, their co-workers who are coming from the Palestinian areas, um, uh, the Palestinian areas in nearby. Kalandia, the refugee camp of Kalandia, uh, the village of Aqib and other villages uh, in this area, but also Aram um, and maybe even some from Eastern uh, Jerusalem. Okay, so this is, this is what they do. Some of these workers used to bring their children um, to these factories. Um, the younger children, you know, would have fun. The older children actually would start uh, uh, becoming workers themselves in these uh, factories. By the time I started visiting that place as a 
young, uh, very, very small child of my father. Um, there were already, I think, at, at least two cousins of mine who were 16 and 17 were already working there because they were already high school dropouts and they basically expected to become workers in this, in this factory. Okay. Now I mentioned, I put the donkey here because it was quite cozy. Because uh, it was, as I said, you know, despite the realities, it was fun, you know, if you were a child going to that place, because you could go outside and play, um, you know, what, watch the people, you know, working with their machines, you know, moving all of this stuff, enjoying the noise. Um, and the relationship between the people, all of them, you know, speak Arabic, you know, were quite good. Um, of course, um, there were hierarchies. Um, between the workers, you know, most of the most of the Palestinians, you know, were operating the machines as lesser workers or as disciples of the Jewish workers who had a little bit more experience in operating these machines. Um, when cars, you know, when trucks were coming in uh, to bring uh, um, to bring material, you know, usually the Jews handled that. The Jews handled the the, the paperwork as as well, um, and, and so on. But by and large, you know, there were very, very close connections between the two populations, okay? It is very clear and should be very clear to everybody here that, you know, the, this is a theater um, in which, you know, different powers, in fact, contend, you know, and when you can see how hierarchies are created, and I'm just going to mention one word in this context, which is ma'allim, yes? Now, if you were an Iraqi boy in, Jerus in West Jerusalem, you know, the word Mu'alim was usually a respectable family name of someone who was a teacher in Baghdad. But Mu'alim in this context here is basically means the Jewish foreman or any Jewish worker in this particular, uh, in this particular factory and in other factories, okay. Um, mostly um, the the uh, work would begin around seven o'clock, you know, end up around uh, around uh, four, and there was a moment in which you know you have everybody sitting down and eating the food that they were bring uh, bring from home during uh, from home during lunch. Um, this was somewhat separated, but not entirely separated, and there was a lot of sharing um, uh, going on. Um, many of the relationships that were forged in this factory continued later, you know, in, during the weekends or in the evenings uh, when people would meet in the old city or in the markets of Ramallah and Bethlehem, because most of the people who worked in these areas, this is also when they did their business, okay? So um, there was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of cordial relationship, but I, cannot, I can say that I don't remember any instance in which actually someone from the Palestinian territory visited a Jewish colleague in Western Jerusalem or vice versa. That never happened. But a lot of other encounters um, did happen. The most fascinating encounter, you know, if you were a small child in this location is of course around donkeys, because in the afternoon, the children of the workers um, getting out of schools, you know, would come uh, uh, to, the, to the area nearby the factory and play. And they would play with some of the Jewish kids that came during vacation times with their parents to, uh, to play there. And the most, of course, bewildering, exciting experience was riding a donkey, okay? Plenty of donkeys in these uh, um, uh, 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 territories. And there you could see like a very interesting ironies. Of course, you know, the Palestinian kids were much better in riding donkeys, you know, and understanding the environment than any other uh, Jewish kid. But everybody knew enough Arabic to communicate and to enjoy themselves, you know, in this, um, in this kind of uh, a game and other games that they were playing. I'm particularly mentioned this because, you know, I often wonder and think about what happened with these kids and where they are now, okay? Which brings me to today, and I want to close. Before I will, I will, uh, I, I will move to the uh, to the contemporary realities of the past two decades. I will say that, in hindsight, if I want to understand the history of labor in these areas, in this particular area, as kind of as a metaphor to what is going on, it was a place in which you know the city and the government used it in order to further the process of proletarization of Arab Jews, which as I argue in the, um, in the article for Ronit is something that is, begins as a vision in the early days, in the early days of Zionist settlement in the land, okay? And it always has twists and, and ironies in, in, in it, 
Okay, if the earlier workers, earlier Mizrahi workers mostly in Jerusalem, mostly worked in construction because that was the biggest project, yes, and the biggest economy in the city. And the women works in cleaning, they worked in cleaning because this was the, the because the bureaucracy in the city was booming, yes. Um, the creation of the industrial zone in Atarot or in Kalandia was, you know, the next phase. It was enabled actually by the fact that suddenly a very large pieces, very large pieces of land with and a lot of nearby, you know, cheap work, work workforce, Palestinian workforce was, you know, becoming available and the government used that. Okay. If you look in the inside the processes that were going on there, so we see two things. Rural Palestinians, you know, from the villages and from the camp are becoming proletar proletarianized, you know, in that area, but in the, those factories. But the agents, those who teach them, you know, their skills are Mizrahi Jews, you know, only a few years older, you know, who migrated as young teens to Israel in the 50s and the 60s and were growing up straight into these factories. You know, and they have enough skills to do to do exactly that. So they become agents of you know the proletarization of you know the, those uh, uh, um, those Palestinians. This is a very important point, I think, to understand how it was going on. I'm, I know that I'm descri describing somewhat idyllic uh, situation. It is not idyllic at all. It is idyllic maybe from the point of view of you know of a young boy watching all of that. Okay, and of course. It comes to an end, begins to come to an end in 1988 with the eruption of the first uh, Intifada, 87 and 88. And throughout the 90s, we see two processes. First of all, the, secure, the questions of security in those areas make it very, very hard for these factories to operate. Second, with the coming of the second Intifada, we begin to see the building of the wall that now make it impossible for people from, let's say, the refugee camp of Shafat or the refugee camp of Kalandia or other areas, very, very huge, uh, large neighborhoods and other villages which are now closer to Ramallah to actually have access to those factories. In addition to that, the labor force in Israel is changing, okay? First of all, the boys, the children of these workers no longer interested in becoming workers. And then you have other, a lot of foreign workers, Romanians, Chinese, Thais and others who are coming to Israel and changing the, the map of, uh, of you know, uh, hard labor in Israel in this context. Okay, so you have now a different logic. You have a logic of you know globalization. You have a logic of uh, um, new division in the city, a different type of division uh, um, in the city, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, in the dictates, you know, in fact, the making of that industrial zone into an entirely Jewish industrial zone, in fact, even more prosperous than before, um, uh, for many many reasons. Where are the Palestinians? Uh, behind the fences, you know, this is um, an early view of the Kalandia checkpoint, a very, very fa famous uh, checkpoint there. This is another view of that. This is from 2006. You know, this is the close to towards the end of the um, of the second intifada. Um, this is Kalandia refugee camp from from where many, many workers would would used to come to um, uh, to these factories in this industrial uh, uh, zone. And so this is another view of that uh, camp, of that checkpoint uh, today. I think I'm almost done. Um, and I'm going to make some comments, you know, general comments about uh, uh, history. And I want to take, go back to the moment where I took this picture of the donkey. So the picture of the donkey in this area is from a movie about, uh, that is done about Mahmoud Darwish um, by um, someone I know very well, Simon Bitton. And there's a moment where he's like, roaming around in this area between Ramallah and Jerusalem, and suddenly you hear the donkey, the donkey that you just saw before. And uh, Mahmoud Darwish says, you know, I wish I were a donkey because the only thing that is stable in Palestine, in fact, it is the donkey. And it's his irony because this is the man who wrote the, 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 the famous poem about the horse. Why did you leave the horse alone? Yes, but here he talks about the donkey. He says the donkey mocks our history um, and is the only uh, um, a stable thing, the, the donkeys will always remain, uh, remain there, yes. When I saw that, when I was thinking of putting this together, I was starting to think about, you know, the image of the donkey staying there and the image of the Palestinian children, you know, riding the donkeys. Um, and I was wondering what was going on into them, with them today. 
And when I was, when I gave an earlier version of that particular, or much shorter version of this talk a few months ago in Hebrew, in uh, the Association of Sociological Studies, after that I got a letter from a sociology professor who has a Palestinian PhD student whose father was a worker um, in that, in that in, not particularly, not, may, maybe not in that factory, but in one of the factories in the Kalandia Atarot Industrial Zone. And quote, she said, what I just heard, you know, from the Jewish side was exactly what my father told me, um, um, you know, how things were, were, were there in the 70s. Maybe her father was, you know, one of those kids that I met, you know, in that area. They are now behind the wall or behind the checkpoint, you know. But I would like to end it by saying, you know, this history will never be complete unless, you know, we write it together, you know. In other words, where I did the, I'm not sure that, you know, they experienced the exact same things that I did. But, you know, it was very interesting to write a collaborative history of that particular location and, you know, start to understand the mechanisms of labor and the history of labor and the importance of labor in cities like Jerusalem uh, in a different way. I think this is it. Thank you very much, <clears> Tzvi. <throat> I found it fascinating, the detail and the thickness of the description. As a sociologist, I'm particularly interested in thick description. And I found that the idea of writing the history of that period collaboratively fascinating, difficult, but fascinating. And I think this is what we should aspire to, but also I think telling your story, the story of the Mizrahim from all points of view. And I think looking at the cleaning women, I think Nina Mozafi Haller did some work on, on Mizrahi cleaning yes. women, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. But um, what really, I want to put the first question before because I can't see I see, yeah, I see, I see one question there, but before that, I would like to ask you, the apartheid um, reports that have been published recently have got a lot of um, criticism from Israelis and some Palestinian Israelis to say really Palestinians are fully integrated within the state of Israel. They are doctors, they are nurses, they are they are pharmacists, they are judges, and they can do anything they want. There's no apartheid um, within Israel, but there's also no real apartheid within historic Palestine. Would you like to maybe briefly relate to that? Because what, point, you, from... what you say is, is, a, is a real regime of apartheid. What you, yeah, from the you point of view, from the point, yeah, to relate to this from the point of view of the story that I was just telling. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, if we think about, you know, the questions of uh, uh, the questions of labor in the particular period that I was trying to uh, uh, um, focus on here. Okay, so you see different reverses and ironies. What are the reverses and ironies? First of all, it is a story of integration, you know, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, you know, the Israeli government, because of internal problems and because of uh, um, ideas about, you know, how to develop these areas, you know, begins to invest in that industrial zone. And this is a dual investment. This is basically, this is a socialist government, quote unquote, you know, so they bring in socialist money um, and, you know, private capital, you know, to, to support private capital and private industry in this area. And they do integrate, you know, Palestinian workers, okay? They clearly want to do that, okay? Now, they don't think in terms of apartheid or not apartheid. I mean, there is there is the apartment, there is an apartment as an idea, and there is an apartment as a lived experience and is a result of something that is going on. Okay. Now, it, why is it important to accentuate the integration or to highlight the idea of integration in that period? Because you know, these workers had shared lives. I'm not romanticizing that. You know, of course, it was not without uh, uh, problems, but they shared the same workplace. By the way, I mean. The Ashkenazi owners, you never saw them in, this, in, in these factories. They, they were already remote, you know. The, many of the Mizrahi workers became sort of foremen and they were running it, you know, for them, okay? So it's a story about integration. However, as soon as, as soon as, you know, you have a different realities, the realities of Oslo, the realities of the 
um, in the wake of 1998, the realities of the changes in the in the global uh, uh, workforce with the with the result of globalization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and particularly, you know, what is going on in the early 2000s, then you have two things. First of all, it is very clear that actually the Palestinian workers are superfluous. They're not superfluous because you know their skill is no longer needed. Yes, the way uh, let's say uh, Ro Rosa Luxemburg would put it, they are superfluous because you know. Originally, the idea was that they need to be pushed out. The whole logic of labor from the early days of Zionism is that you need to proletarianize masses of people in order to push away the Palestinian worker, okay? This is the whole logic of what they call Hebrew work, okay? Now, Hebrew work was one thing in mandatory Palestine and in the early days, you know, but after 1950, we need to think about it in a different way because Hebrew work sometimes doesn't mean really, really the Jewish workers do the work. It means, you know, the Palestinian workers are not doing the work. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Or they are doing the work when we really need them to do the work and later on, they don't, okay? Fact of the matter is that most of the the work, these, the, these workers in Kalandia Kalan are no longer working there, you know, because it is not the interest of anyone, you know, from the Israeli side to have them there, okay, because of a regime of checkpoints, a regimes of separations, and, and, uh, and so on. So whether or not this is apartheid, I think, you know, when we focus on the name, we focus, we, we miss some of the, we, we, we miss some of the points that we can see that actually sometimes even worse, okay. What exactly is the condition of the people who live in the refugee camp of Shafat and in Kalandia? Theoretically, you can say, well, they're integrated. You know, they take Israeli social security and everything. But in all other ways, they are not integrated. In fact, they are beyond walls. Mm -hmm. So, this is I'm not. This is a uh, this is a quasi complicated answer, but following the idea of the thick description, and mostly wanted to focus on the fact that you know we need to see what is going on in labor between 67 and 19 and let's say in 1993 and between 1993 and 2006 basically that until it is disappearing i would say one more thing about that as well but if you go today to jerusalem you will find out that people from east jerusalem not you know from these territories where i'm talking about that are beyond walls people from east jerusalem basically make the workforce that run the hotels and um, um, run a lot of uh, a lot of shops and so on, and in the malls of Western Jerusalem, that's what they do. Mm. Now, is that apartheid? Well, you know, you'd hear in reports, no, you know, there's integration. You have doctors in the hospitals, etc., etc., etc. So it's not apartheid, but actually it is if you think about if you think about the mechanisms that create the, created the situation in which you know the people who staff the hotels, men, the hotel industry, you know, which is a very very poor industry, you know, are uh, um, are Palestinians, you know. But again, these are from East Jerusalem, not from Northern Jerusalem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Claire Short was asking, was there a potential for Mizrahi workers and Palestinian workers to develop friendships? and union relationships and radical common actions. I think you've answered some of it, but maybe you'd like to um, yes. elaborate a bit about that. Yeah, I was brushing over this, but absolutely yes, okay. Arabic, the Arabic language was a common language here, okay. Um, and there you can see, by the way, you know, who could relate much faster. It is very clear that the Iraqi, the Iraqi and the Egyptian uh, uh, Jews who are this, who speaking a form of a Mashraki Arabic was ab were able to transition into Palestinian Arabic much faster and being more and more effective of that. They usually, the Iraqis made the majorities of the workers in this, in this, uh, in these uh, factories. And then yes, friendship were forged over that because, you know, this is a shared culture. So there's question of music, um, the questions of the cinema in East Jerusalem, where you can go and you meet your colleagues there. Um, sometimes, you know, it's about, you know, getting music from Iraq that you, the Palestinian workers could get from Jordan, you know, bring it to the old city and then bring it over to their, uh, to their friends. You know, this is what I call the Nazem al-Ghazali effect. Nazem al-Ghazali is a very famous Iraqi singer that many, many Iraqi Jews in Israel swear in his name. But actually he becomes famous in Iraq after the major, the mass migration of Iraqi Jews outside. So how do they know this guy? They know this guy from the radio. They know this guy mm -hmm. because he married a famous Iraqi Jewish woman. But they obtain the recordings, you know, from their friends, you know, who are bringing them uh, uh, from Jordan and from Egypt and from others because there is a measure of, of connection 
uh, to people who live in Bethlehem, Ramallah, and East Jerusalem with the rest of the Arab world. So yes, now, unionization. I would have loved to go back in the time machine and see a radical union, you know, uh, um, uh, forming. Okay, but let us not forget that this is under the regime of the Histadrut, which basically it's a governmental op operation. You know, it's not a real union labor. It's also an owner. Okay, and theoretically it represents everybody. Okay, um, so there was no need for a union, just as if you know um, during in the Soviet bloc, you did bloc, you didn't have a, you didn't need, need a union because of course it's a communist society, so everybody is already integrated or unionized. Okay, so in that regard, there was no, never a need for a real union because theoretically there was one. It would have been wonderful if there, um, if there was. But that also that begs another question. What happened to the worker rights to, of the former workers of these, uh, of these factories after 2003 when they begin to build the wall and keep them outside the wall? Many of them are retirees. I wonder, do they get the social security? Uh, do they get the pensions? You know, do they get any, any payments from the history group? I wonder, you know, this is something that clearly needs to be explored. Thank you very much. I see Amir Alkali has got his hand um, up. Would you like to ask your question face to face? Yes, yes, thank you, Ronit. I just wanted to make a comment, Svika. This was uh, extraordinarily moving and extraordinarily valuable. This is something that uh, you know, you know, I'm a little bit familiar with the subject, and this is really extremely important work. You're basically filling in a map that has been left blank, pretty much, uh, of all of these relationships and all of these movements and how that relates to labor, capital, uh, personhood, identity, language. Uh, it's just fantastic. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Amina. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question in the chat about the Black Panthers and yes. their links with the real Jerusalem and how these demonstrations were the main one in Jewish by Jewish workers. The Ashkenazi left was totally cop copied and did not go into the streets against the government. Co okay, co-opted so, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, as it happens, I have a lot to say about that because this week um, um, the Jewish Voice for Peace hosted the, co the one of the last co-founders of the Black Panther movement, Ruvena Bergil, who was in the city. He's a 70-year-old uh, man from Musrara. So I, I was, he served as his translator. So I heard a lot about, about that. And it's also alive in, uh, in my own uh, memories and understandings of, of what happened. So yes, I mean, I'm gonna say a few things that he said uh, only a few days ago in New York. Part of the story of the Black Panthers has to do with, you know, important links to the, to Matspen, the Revolutionary Communist League that was operating in the city, particularly radical students, you know, who were um, in contact with the youngsters in the Musrara neighborhood. Maybe you'd like to say a couple of words about Matspen. For people who don't know. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know, with Moshek <laughs> in the crowd, I'm going to be very hesitating to say that. Matspen, uh, I think, started in '62. Um, it's uh, split from the Communist Party, explaining all sorts of disappointments, you know, from the policies of the Communist Party at the time. You know, I can share that, you know, from a version of the uh, uh, late 1980s, you know, same version of that. You know, it is at some point becomes, you know, I think this is after um, a while, it becomes a Trotskyist, more, mostly associated with the Fourth International and Trotskyist organization. This is how I meet that, uh, that organization, but it's clearly a very, very radical. When I said in the beginning of my talk that, you know, some of these communist frameworks in Jerusalem, the operative were, you know, aspiringly binational. Yes, the Communist Party was binational. I mean, the, the student party cell in the late 80s in the Hebrew University had 40 students who were Palestinian and maybe five or six who were, uh, um, who were Jews. Okay, so they were binational. But in terms of the Matspen and the, and the other organization were aspiring to be, they had connections with the old city 
um, and with place in Ramallah and in, 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 in uh, Bethlehem. So that was very, very important in terms of, you know, the, the way they understood the geography of the city and the geography of the connections with the Palestinians. Okay, so that was number part one. Now, it, I would hesitate to talk about direct influence because it comes from different directions. Reuven, for example, reminded us of a person, a fascinating person by the name of Naomi Kiss. Naomi Kiss was, um, she was a, a social uh, scientist, you know, who was born in Brooklyn to a Jewish family. She migrated to Israel. She was very highly interested in questions of labor. She was the one who brought the news about the Black Panthers. Remember, there was no TV in Israel, and I don't think that the Israeli radio was reporting positively over the Black Panthers movement in the United States. She was the one who brought the news about uh, Black Panthers. She was actually quite active in helping to uh, put together the Black Panther agenda and so on. But in the end, the Black Panthers movement and the protest, you know, in its Mizrahi incarnation grew out of the realities of uh, particularly in Jerusalem um, of discrimination um, in housing, in labor, in health, uh, um, in almost every social aspect uh, uh, of life. It is not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that it erupts in Musrara in particular, because this neighborhood has been heavily hit with gentrification almost immediately after 67, because now it is no longer dangerous. The sniper geography is gone. Okay, It's no longer dangerous to live there, so immediately these people are being evacuated. Okay. Um, um, and there is a real, real struggle, a real struggle, you know, of what to do with uh, um, with the people that, who live in, in, in extreme uh, uh, poverty. So I would say it is kind of a match between, you know, the left, uh, um, the more organized Marxist left in the city, other, you know, serendipities such as uh, 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 Naomi Keys who died is a very, uh, at a very young age. In fact, there's, a, there's a, a street after her in Jerusalem, but it's in East Jerusalem, near Salah Adin Street. Okay, that's the place where she's commemorated. Um, but, but basically, the, the young people, you know, even though they were inspired by the Black Panthers movement in the United States, you know, their agendas were forged by the realities um, uh, in Jerusalem. I mentioned before the question of the logic of who leaves the camps first. So part of the resentment was that people did see their Ashkenazic neighbors leave the camps within six months. Well, some of them lived 15 years in, the, in those camps. Within six months after arrival, after the Gumulka uh, migration in 53, Polish Jews came to the camps, but they lived them within six months, okay? Um, the, earlier, the earlier protest movement of Vali Salib in, um, in uh, uh, Haifa in 59 started because Moroccan uh, Jews in that area, so, you know, again, this is a Palestinian neighborhood that is now being, becoming uh, inhabited by migrants, you know, they see who gets the better apartments and who doesn't, you know, so that, that part of resentment builds into, um, into uh, 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 that and forms into a, a, a protest, okay? We can say that you, the, the Black Panthers movement, which is now pretty much the 50th anniversary we are celebrating now, 71, 20, 71, 72, has a huge impact in the way the government thinks. I hinted, I cannot prove it, but I think it's part of it that one of the reasons they begin to invest so much in labor, yes, and finding out labor solutions is precisely because, you know, the government is worried about all of these youngsters that are, don't have a lot of work, you know, inside the city and they need to do something with them. If I'm allowed one more point, you know, to tie to the logic of settlement in Jerusalem, where do these people go? In other words, after 67, you have these huge projects that the government built in, in different areas of the city between 50 and 67. Where do these people go, you know, when now the government wants to evacuate them and get rid of them or when, you know, gentrification occurs in that. So if, if you look at the, government, the uh, neighborhood of Katamoni, so they go to Neve Akov, which is beyond the green line. They go to uh, Gilo, which is, uh, uh, again, beyond the green line. They go to uh, Armona Natsif. This is where my family moved to and where I spent three or four years, you know, um, as a teenager, uh, which is beyond the green line. They go to Maalea Adomim, which is almost uh, um, uh, closer in the direction of going to Jericho. And if you look at the children of these people, 
Okay, so the grandparents live in Katamonim and the parents live in Gilo. And when the grandchildren and the grandchildren who get married, now they live in the area of Har Homa, which is Jabal Aburne. Now, Jabal Aburne in the eight, in the 90s, there was a huge protest against building in there. Okay, because it was completely changing, you know, the geography of the West Bank, which was supposedly emerging as the new home of the Palestinian Authority. Okay. And Netanyahu hesitated in building there. But once Barak came to power, immediately they turned it into a neighborhood because global protests subsided over it, that area. So now you have generations over generations of living there. If you go to the north, to the neighborhood of Pisgat Ze'ev, which is between the Ram and, you know, uh, um, um, the old city, you know, a huge Jewish neighborhood, rather, uh, um, which is in the new Mizrahi middle class and other middle classes, the, the people who live there are the children of the of, of parents who moved from Katamonim to Neve Yaakov. So this generational uh, going on, uh, this generation connections are going on, and there's a very, very simple logic here. Most of the Mizrahim in Israel, in Jerusalem, live beyond the green line. Because inside the green line, you have just gentrification, and you know, inside the green line, the sniper logic basically meant that, you know, the Ashkenazic Jews, you know, lived inside all Jerusalem. All, all Western Jerusalem. Thank you. Um, Ophira Gamliel has got a question, but I can't find it. Ophira, do you want to put your question to um, in in your voice? Ophira? Yeah, I hear you. Just a minute. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. I'm sorry, I don't feel like really speaking. So, but I was wondering. Um, whether you see the structural inequalities that were built into the system, you know, over the decades, whether you see them as uniquely Israeli or Zionists in any way, um, and if you can compare what you saw as this development in the industrial zones um, to similar structures and development models in the global south. It uh, came into my mind because you started with China. So I thought, you know, I was wondering what led you to look <laughs> at labor relations. Dear Ophira, uh, this I think I cannot do. And I cannot do, I think, within a few minutes in the Q&A compared to other, other uh, situations in the global south. I don't think that there is Zionist ex exceptionalism, you know, I think it clearly we can relate it to other locations, other areas in the world, particularly in the 50s, 60s. There's a logic of development, there's a logic of, you know, state capitalism that might be working on here and so on and so forth. So I will answer only the last part of your question. Why, what draws me to these uh, stories and why do I bring them up here? Two things. One is, I think we need to draw our attention to the need to write, I think, micro histories of that area, or of different locations in Israel and understand them much better because the tendency is to tell a big story, okay? And then lose a lot of it, you know? We, are, we cling to certain orthodoxies, you know, certain paradigms, you know? And then we, we think that these paradigms explain everything to us, you know, but when we, when we look at like small locations such as Kalandia and we follow what happened or Sheikh Badr, we follow what happened there, we can come up with a much more complicated story that usually doesn't make it give a discount to, to Zionism, you know, makes it even makes the story even look a lot worse, you know, but within it, you see other things going on uh, as well. Okay, um, I think this is clearly the case with Lifta Sheikh Bader, and, and I hope that I can demonstrate this with the question of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Kalandia in that context. The second part, I really want to draw the attention and bring the class back in, um, in this context. We don't, we intend Mizrahi scholarship and scholarship about Mizrahim, in my view, tend to be in the past uh, two decades in particular to focus mostly on questions of representation um, and focus mostly on you know, issues of cultural liminality. Are there Arabs? Are there Jews? They are in between all of these things. And you know, mm. forget that there, is, there are social realities be, be, that are much more important you know, and you know, they move a lot of things <coughs> underneath. <clears throat> the question of proletarization, for example, when it was treated 
by Shlomo Zvisli, for example, this famous sociologist, it was written only in the context of rural Mizrahi settlements, such as the development towns. No one really looked at what happened in the big cities, which is where the masses of the people lived, where the great movements are coming from the big cities in the 70s and in the 60s, Haifa, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. Okay, so we need to bring class back in and we need to treat it, you know, without too many ideological uh, prejudices at the beginning. Start, first of all, start telling the story. Okay, so it, in a way, it is a little bit of a critique against the tendency to focus mostly on cultural issues and re representation. I also think that, you know, the current, the present state of the Mizrahi discourse is very much interested that we will focus on, on culture. Yes, and here I can will make a reference to China because when you talk about culture and you know resentment, you know you forget about the economy and you forget the real inequality that is going on in the economy, okay? Which is an ongoing, uh, uh, which is an ongoing uh, uh, situation. Finally, when we think about class, we can understand also the present situation in the relationship between Jews and Palestinians, okay? Think think about the level of hatred right now the level of violence right now in the past 20 years, okay, uh, that is going on. Does it have something to do with the fact that people are now, you know, segregated, one people is segregated beyond walls and you never see them in the eye and you somehow are completely out of touch with their humanity, yes? Um, whereas before, you know, there were hierarchies, you know, the Mizrahi Jews who were, worked in Kalandia were citizens of the state of Israel, yes? But they were still, you know, and, and the Palestinians were not citizens of the, st of the state of Israel, but both of them were exploited and they were both of them part on the stage in the same theater, even though that theater was an area of contention that of, some of them contended. You know, I'm thinking about the children of these workers. How do they see that? How do, do they remember that past? You know, and how do they relate to that past and how do they translate it today into, you know, uh, the, their, the way they understand life and the way they understand, you know, the violence between Jews and Palestinians. Okay. Thank you. We have three hands risen. One is um, Chaim Breshit, Abe Hayim, and Moshe Machover. And I suggest we take Abe first, and then Moshe, and then to end with Chaim. Is that all right? Abe, please. Abe, are you there? Hello, yes, uh, I, am, I am there. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting um, talk about the um, Ma'ab I wrote because uh, my family come from Iraq and um, most of my uncles and aunts actually left at that time in the 50s. And um, uh, one of my uncles actually was in a Ma'ab I think for nearly 30 or 40 years. You know, it, it, it was yeah. eight before he was actually given a proper house. Uh, but to come to the question of workers, um, I, uh, uh, there's a most interesting book um, called Stone Men by Andrew Ross. Yes, he talks I about read that book. It was Palestinians who actually built Israel, even mm. within you know, Tel Aviv, you know, the white city, and um, uh, were actually even through the period of Jewish labor, as it were, they were employed, uh, you know, to build the cities in Israel. And of course, today, they are the ones that um, are helping to build cities. And of course, there's a lot of cross, um, across the Green Line, um, workers who go illegally through. Um, and um, so, in fact, um, you know, with the uh, 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 tradition of stone, masonry and building and the quarries, uh, the Palestinians really were the basis of uh, the construction work. And uh, what I'd uh, want to ask you was, uh, were any of the Mizrahim involved in um, the construction industry um, uh, in all these areas, you know, in East Jerusalem and um, uh, all the other cities and um, Moshabim that you mentioned? And were they part of this workforce and what is the situation today yeah this, uh, issue yeah so i'm going to make a comment about the earlier part of what you said yes i mean the, the question i think when we come to the with the question of palestinian labor it is true um in jerusalem you know the construction workers in the 50s and the 60s were exclusively jewish 
There's no question about that, you know, because actually the supply of Palestinian workforce before 67 was relatively limited in Jerusalem itself, where, whereas elsewhere, you know, you could actually tap into, you know, Palestinians who were citizens of Israel who are now becoming workers. This is part of the story that I did not discuss here at all because I was focusing on Jerusalem and I was interested to look at what happens before and after 67. Okay. Um, and the question of Palestinian labor, yes, you know, they do build Israel and they do now build, many of them build work in the settlements. The question is when do they stop and how and why? Okay. And if we, and if we tell a story such as the factories in Kalandia, we can see exactly, uh, you know, within that circumstances, which I think are unique, you know, why, why they stop and how easily, you know, they're given up. You know, the government gives up on them. As I say, you know, in 1970, the Israeli government was interested in using, in turning these people into a, a workforce. They, they, were talk, they specifically speak about an available, available workforce, okay? And then at some point, you know, it is no longer needed, okay? Because I think it is always living on a borrowed time. Always, 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 Palestinian labor is is a question is on borrowed time. No matter whether they build a settlement or they work uh, um, uh, or, or they work in um, um, in a different uh, um, area. I mean, in on the green line, beyond the green line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, whereas um, did the, the part of your question was about you know um, if if. Mizrahim built the, yes, I think that in the 50s and in the 60s, Mizrahim make the, the, the majority of the working class um, in Israel. In the book that Moshe Behar and I edited, there is a report from 1958 by Avraham Abbas about the conditions of the Mizrahi work, uh, workforce. He was the most, he was the most knowledgeable person in of that subject because he was working, uh, he was in charge of Mizrahi labor as a member of the Hista group. I think his job was basically to manage, quote unquote, that labor, but he became disillusioned when he realized how, you know, Mizrahim in that period become, you know, are becoming basically racialized, you know, inferior and becoming inferior precisely because, you know, the government is deliberately interested into turning them into, prolet into the new proletariat. Um, I can see that the time has come to, it's an hour and a half. Are we able to go another 10 minutes, Chaim? Unmute, unmute. Yes, of course. Okay, so I'll ask uh, Professor Moshe Machover to ask the next question, please. Hi, Moshe. Hi, uh, it's not really a question. It's uh, uh, just a couple of comments, very brief. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I can't praise enough the, the, the quality and the, the sophistication of what I heard. I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, one particular point I want to emphasize and reinforce, the category of uh, apartheid may be useful as, as a propagandist, uh, a descriptive uh, 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 category, but it's useless as a, a, an analytic category. It is not, I mean, I, I mean it, it, it is only confusing if you try to use it as an analytic category. Uh, uh, the the uh, categories of colonization and of class are what one needs to use here, not uh, uh, the label of apartheid, which, which is ambiguous in any case. Uh, and finally, a sectarian uh, uh, point, uh, the, uh, as for the characterization of Matspen, the, there was a slight uh, inaccuracy here. At the time of the Black Panthers, uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, 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 split of Matspen that became Trotskyist, not the main uh, body, but the split in Jerusalem did not exist. So uh, Matspen at, at the time of the uh, Black Panthers and the main body of Matspen later on was not Trotsky's. It, a, a Trotsky's faction formed later on and was particularly strong in Jerusalem. But uh, if you want to uh, uh, learn about Matspen, there is a, 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 an enormously rich website of Matspen in, in three, three and a half languages. I mean, uh, Hebrew, English, and Arabic. There's a little bit in French as well. So go there, it's very easy to find, and you can, you can find 
both uh, uh, the history and the, the uh, theoretical production of Max Payne re richly represented there. And I invite people, if you are interested, please go there and, and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe. You, you. you are obviously the most knowledgeable person about Max Payne. Yes. And thank you for your comment. Yes. Tzvika. Yeah, if I'm allowed to uh, react to uh, what uh, Moshe Mahavar just said. First of all, I never imagined, you know, I'm, you can imagine that I am in dialogue with you for many, many years. This is, I think, <laughs> the first time we actually talk, you know, face to face, so to speak. And of course, you know, I'm going to write this on the CV, what you just said earlier about that. So I'm very, very happy. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, um, it, it, so it is an honor to uh, to finally be in, be in conversation and so on. And I think, you know, part of the critique of the, I think Matspein, whether Trotskyist or not, you know, was important in critiquing, you know, other leftist organizations and communist organizations, you know, for not doing enough or, you know, basically going to, uh, not being very, very clear on questions of labor, on question of, of questions of Zionism and so on. I think I would like to think that even in the Trotskyist incarnation in all of the verses, you know, were part, this is what the spirit, uh, uh, of much pain uh, uh, represented. I mean, the, the the period, you know, when people like me and 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 few others, you know, were joining much pain were actually questions of, you know, the way in which the Communist Party related to the second, in, the, the first Intifada, the question of the Soviet Union, and the disillusionment from the possibility that it would become democratic. So. In a sense, Matspen was Trotskyist in the sense that, you know, just like Trotsky was expelled from the party, so the Trotskyists were expelled from the party. You know, I think we can find a common ground there. Uh, but you, I think you very, your comment about um, I, the, uh, the power of ideological paradigms, you know, you mentioned uh, apartheid and, you know, I could mention several other paradigms, is important in the sense that, you know, as historians and as people who look at the reality, it's really, really important that we make a difference between um, cat uh, 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 cat uh, analytical categories that become paradigmatic, settler, col settler colonialism, apartheid, and et cetera, and be very wary of, the, of their tendency sometimes to become orthodoxies. Because if they become orthodoxies, they prevent us from looking into the situation more clearly and analyze it uh, 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 better. I had, and I mentioned Ronit in this context, I had a very interesting dialogue, an intense internal dialogue, you know, with, uh, with uh, uh, settler colonialism. And one of my points was the, uh, as a paradigm, but as orthodoxy, I would say it prevents us to see, you know, realities such as this one in terms of labor in Jerusalem, okay? <laughs> because if we treat all of these Mizrahi workers as settlers, we're gonna miss the story, okay? I'm not trying now to, take away from the moral power of the settler colonial, uh, 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 the settler colonial uh, uh, paradigm as a paradigm and, and, and from its analytical powers, it is very, very important. But at the same time, if it becomes an orthodoxy and we cling to basically use that as a device to interpret everything that we see, we might lose, uh, uh, um, a, um, it, we might lose issues such as, you know, what happens to the working class in Jerusalem. It's making its demise and the changes that it's going through, you know, because of what, because of different, uh, uh, the different and the, and the main and the main factors that are going on. There. Um, the biggest example for that that I try to illustrate is what happens in Kalandia in 1912 versus what happens in Kalandia in 1971. In 1912, the story is about agriculture, milk to Jerusalem. Okay, and in 1971, the story about industry, okay, and it's no longer a kind of a quasi-socialist uh, agricultural settlement, it's about building an industrial zone, okay, which today, by the way, is exclusively Jewish. And so, today, okay. today, the area of Atarot Kalandia is scheduled to become a huge um, Jewish settlement and yeah. um, national park. This is yeah. recently in an article in Haaretz by Nir Khatzon. very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Chaim Brashit, yeah. Yeah. next question. Um, I'm not sure that this is the right point to, be, to ask this question yeah. um, because uh, it will take a long time to answer, but maybe you can say a few words about it. Um, what I wanted to inquire about is your view about the relationship to power 
of the Mizrahim during the period you talked about, which actually didn't come up in the series until now and probably needs another meeting altogether, but probably you can broach this. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the period uh, referred to mainly by your two colleagues, Shiko and Hila before, um, we didn't actually have the time and the space to discuss that relationship to the power center. But we know that um, the Mizrahim were basically kept out of all power circles um, and only received um, purely symbolical representation. Um, this changes at some point, but I wanted to say that while uh, Labour and the left parties disregarded the Mizrahim or denied them any part, uh, Begin understood um, the, um, the, the, the dynamics uh, and actually spoke to uh, Mizrahim uh, audiences uh, more often than any other politician. Um, and therefore, uh, he also got a lot of their votes in 1979. So there is this process um, which is very fascinating and complex and relates to class and relates to the, the changes in the class structure of the Mizrahim in the 60s and 70s. And I wonder if you could uh, just lead us to the answer and probably another meeting will yeah. be necessary to really deal with it. Yeah, I can do it very briefly remapping several points of what I was talking about. So if you remember, I mentioned, you know, the, the Ma'barot is like the transition camps is a, is a site for political activity. And I mentioned Abraham Abbas giving a talk in, Mar in the Tapio transition camp in 1955. Okay. So the state always had its own representatives, you know, negotiating between, you know, the people in the Ma'barot who were understood from the, almost from the very beginning as a dangerous population. Okay, and justifiably so. I mean, these people who live in tents, you know, for generations, you know, for, for decades, you know, and they, they have a lot of problems. Okay, so, but let's focus for a second on, on Jerusalem. The resentment and the friction in Jerusalem is between, mostly, between the large Mizrahi proletariat and the state-made middle class who is basically making the bureaucracy of the ministries of the government in Jerusalem and other uh, governmental institutions, including the Hista Group, okay? With capitalists, with private own, privately owned, with like real capitalists, it's actually less so of a friction because they are there, but they are, you don't see them in the eye. You know, you don't, you never see, when you go to that factory, I went to that factory with my father for years in the 70s. I think once the owner came and everybody treated him like as if God was visiting the place, okay? I mean, the friction was actually between all the, with the bureaucrats, the clerks whom you, whose offices people were cleaning. And there's an interesting illustration for that. If you look at the two, and I will tie this to Begin. If you look at the two uh, football clubs in the 70s in Jerusalem, so, so you will see that Hapoel uh, Yerushalayim, you know, um, is, you know, associated so-called with the, with the left, you know, it has um, a hammer and a sickle in its, uh, in its uh, symbol and so on. Actually, this is the, this is the, this is the, the team that the fans come from the state bureaucracy, okay, from the Labour Party state bureaucracy, they are their fans. Who, who are the fans of Betar Yerushalayim, which is a nationalist, uh, uh, begging Likud kind of associated uh, football team? Actually, the working classes, the Mizrahi working classes. Okay, um, today this team is, is the, the fans are incredibly racist and they are proud proud of being racist. But you know, I'm a Betar fan. I did not change. You know, uh, um, you don't change your fo football team. But I remember in the 70s it was actually poorly managed very poor, not very good. And part of the hostility and the resentment was because, you know, Apollo Yerushalayim represented the government. Socialism was the government, okay? And the other way around. So this is, a, a, the, the ironies of power here are, are, are interesting and, you know, the way in which uh, 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 they are built. It may explain also why the Likud in 1977, particularly in places such as Jerusalem, although there are historic ties, between the old pre-48 Mizrahi population of the city, yes, um, and the, the Etzel, 
yes, the uh, the precursor, the militia, the militia that was the precursor of the Likud. There were some historic ties. I mean, they were present also in the Yassin massacre, which we didn't discuss here today. Um, there was some presence of these these kind of people, but you know. Begin is manages to capitalize that, and clearly part of the results of the part of the results, at least partially, the results of the Black Panthers eruption results in the vote, massive vote for Begin in 1977 uh, uh, for the Likud. It's part of the rebellion because they were able to do that. Now, my two cents into this is that the friction was not between workers and capitalists. Because there would be also little friction between the Likud and the Mizrahi workers. The friction was, first of all, between the huge uh, uh, governmentally owned uh, labor unions and, of course, the government itself. As I saw, as I saw in Kalandia, it was socialist money and private, uh, private ownership working together. Thank you very, very much. Before I hand it back to Haim, who wants to make a couple of pronouncements. I'd like to thank Tzvi very much for a fantastic talk. I could listen for another couple of hours and I would like to have heard you speak about racialization, but this is for another meeting. Uh, and I think you can all perhaps unmute yourself and give uh, Tzvi a round of applause. How about that? Thank you very much Tzvi and Looking forward to working with you more. Awesome. Time, I hand it back to you and thank you for uh, allowing me to chair this meeting. Thank you both for an, a great meeting and for all of you who ask questions and uh, continue the debate. Uh, this was the high point of an excellent series of um, webinars and uh, it's not the last time we will be dealing with it for sure. Uh, we're already planning the next iteration. I just wanted uh, to uh, tell you that on the 8th of May, uh, in a famous gallery in London, um, JNP and two other organizations, a Christian organization and a Muslim organization, will launch a new initiative which uh, we call the Convivencia Alliance. It is an initiative that um, is, um, well, I, I don't want to claim too much, uh, especially at this point, but to say that um, we want to uh, present um, a note, if you want, um, 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 a framework for future action in Palestine for a just peace uh, between both sides. Uh, and a just peace which is based on uh, inspiration from uh, the Convivencia in Spain and other locations like during the, um, uh, the, the, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, of course. So this uh, will be launched on the 8th of May Please watch our website and our Facebook for, um, uh, you will need to register and I hope many of you will come. This will be an in-person face-to-face event, uh, the first for us in the last two years. And I hope many of you will come and join us. Thank you very much. Uh, and especially Tzvi for an incredible performance. Thank you. Thank you so much.